Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo 2021, Building Your First Fully Functioning Hydrogen Line Radio Telescope, presented by me, Pablo Lewin, WA6RSV. Welcome. Let me fulfill my narcissistic tendencies by telling you just a little bit about myself. I'm, I've been an active ham radio operator, WA6RSV Extra Class, since 1976. I work all bands, all modes, including CW, FTA, Q65, and even Whisper. I have two transmitter working 24-7 right now. They're only 200 milliwatts, but they get all over the place. I am now working towards getting my EME, Earth, Moon, Earth operations active. And of course, that's, that's going to take a while. It's a lot of work. I'm an active citizen scientist, astronomer, member of the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers, the American Astronomical Society, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, and also a member of the NASA Transit Exoplanet Survey Satellite Follow-Up Group 1, where we do follow-up on data coming down from the uh, TESS uh, satellite, and then we send out uh, reduced data to professional astronomers. I own and operate my own private research level backyard observatory, which consists of a Celestron C14, 14-inch uh, 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 telescope, with an as big as big STF 8300 uh, detector on it, uh, and it's a fully automated uh, roll-off roof observatory, uh, weather protected, and everything else. So that's what I do. I'm, I'm also a retired airline pilot, and uh, but uh, I haven't flown in a couple of years now, and uh, this is the my new uniform. I don't have to wear a hat anymore, and I'm enjoying myself. And that's why I get to do these uh, little projects. Uh, briefly, uh, as a means of background, what's radio astronomy? Everybody may or may not know what it is. Radio astronomy is a subfield of astronomy that studies celestial objects at radio frequencies. Every celestial object gives off radio frequencies. Same with gases and even trees and people. Uh, but in this case, we're only studying uh, a certain uh, spectrum of the sky with the system that uh, I'm going to tell you about. The first detection of radio waves from an astronomical object was in 1932 when Carl Jansky, uh, a Bell Telephone Laboratories uh, uh, person, observed radiation coming from the Milky Way when he was actually working on some communication uh, program for the uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories, and it took him a while for him to uh, find out where those radio magnetic uh, waves were coming from. Finally found out it was coming from the sky, and uh, yeah, that's how radio astronomy was uh, uh, born. Grote Reaver, W9GFZ, uh, who died in 2002, was an American pioneer of radio astronomy, which combined his interests in amateur radio and amateur radio astronomy. He was instrumental in investigating and extending Carl Jansky's pioneering work and conducted the first survey uh, of the sky and radio frequencies. His 1937 radio antenna, which, by the way, he built by himself in his normal backyard, was the second ever to be used for astro astronomical purposes and the first parabolic reflecting uh, antenna to be used as a radio telescope. For nearly a decade, he was the only world's radio astronomer, the, the, the world's only radio astronomer. And you can see right here uh, a picture of his uh, system, his antenna, which is a giant contraption, and uh, we, you can't really see from this uh, little picture is the fence to his neighbor, which is uh, right about here. So his backyard was not that big. And uh, credit also goes to his neighbor that really didn't complain much, uh, as far as we know, at uh, Mr. Uh, Reaver having, having this uh, huge 
uh, parabol parabolic antenna in his backyard. And this is Mr. Reber right here, of course. He was a ham radio operator. And you could say that he was uh, the father of uh, radio astronomy, of serious uh, radio astronomy. And by the way, uh, the name Jansky now uh, refers to measurements of uh, power uh, of celesti radio celestial objects, as uh, how many Janskys this uh, uh, galaxy is transmitting are, or milli Janskys, et cetera. Why do this project? Why create uh, uh, a little uh, uh, radio telescope? Why not? I mean, what are we going to do? Watch Netflix all day? We're ham radio operators. We work, uh, we are tinkerers. We work with uh, all kinds of stuff. And keep in mind that this will give you the ultimate galactic short wave listening DX for less than $300 beyond the astronomical reasons for this. The, remember that uh, the maximum Earth DX is what, 24,000 miles if you go a long path. Uh, if you work EME, we're talking about a distance of 600,000 miles plus or minus uh, round trip. That's great. But hydrogen line reception from our galaxy's arms, we are receiving stuff from anywhere from 20, 30, 50, up to 100,000 light years away from your backyard. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how this works. And... Uh, once again, you can do it for less than $300, and it's a nice little project. It's a beginner's project. Anybody can do it. It could be a young teenager uh, uh, to show off uh, the, the radio sky to the world, and or it could be a very uh, dedicated ham radio operator with ultimate skills. Very easy to do. Um, this, this project is going to be good for schools. If they want to have a radio telescope, so they can, the astronomy teacher can explain the radio sky. So let's go on. One more piece of theory, and then I'll get on with it, okay? I promise. If you don't know what the hydrogen line is, here's a brief explanation. Hydrogen atoms randomly emit photons at a wavelength of 21 centimeters which is a frequency of uh, 1.4 gigahertz, 1420.4058 megahertz. Normally, a single hydrogen atom will only very rarely emit a photon. But the galaxy and even empty space is filled with many hydrogen atoms. So the average effect is an observable RF power spike at that frequency. 1420.4058 megahertz. By pointing a radio telescope at the night nice sky and averaging the radio frequency power over time, a power spike indicating the hydrogen line can be observed in a frequency spectrum plot. This can be used for some interesting experiments. For example, you can measure the size and shape of, the, uh, of our galaxy, Thicker areas of our galaxy will have more hydrogen and thus a larger spike. And I'm going to show you this. I have videos to show you. Whereas the spike will be significantly smaller when pointing at empty space. You can also measure the rotational speed of our galaxy by noting the frequency Doppler shift. In this little project that I'm advocating here, which I built and I'm using, will show Doppler shift clearly. And you're going to see it right now. I, I got this picture from uh, from Google, so I got to give him uh, credit uh, from Dickey and Lockman, 1990. This is a neutral hydrogen radio map of the Milky Way. Enough intros and theory. Show me what this $300 system can do for me or for everybody. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then what about a video? Let me show you the picture. This is what the system is going to look like. Very simple. And let me show you a video of the results. Before I do that, this is a uh, Stellarium program, which is free. This is the receiver, the SDR Sharp receiver, which is also free. And this is the plugin. This is the IF average plugin, which will get all the signal and will average and show uh, uh, reception of the hydrogen line from the galaxy. And this will move, signifying 
where the galaxy is and we'll correlate that with the reception here. So let's go ahead and watch this. The antennas point is straight up. You can see now that uh, it's going over the galaxy arm and boom, it's receiving a signal right now, another spike. You can actually see the Doppler effect. This is a whole day recording here. You can just see a little bitty spike right here because the, uh, the antenna is pointing at empty space, but there's still hydrogen, uh, passive hydrogen there. So this is actually detecting it. As the galaxy arm once again passes overhead, you can once again see the reception and uh, it's being recorded on, the, uh, on this program. So basically, this is what this whole program does. It uh, records the averaging of uh, the radio frequencies of the hydrogen line concentrations up in the galaxy as it passes by. And I'm going to show you another video in a second. Uh, the receiver is set to uh, 1420 megahertz, 0.405. And uh, this is your basic radio telescope. I know it doesn't sound exciting, but I'm going to show you something else pretty soon. Okay, how do we build this um, uh, system? The first thing that you want to do is you want to go to rtl-sdr.com. And in fact, you can Google cheap and easy hydrogen line radio astronomy with an RTL-SDR Wi-Fi parabolic grit dish LNA and SDR sharp on January 2020. I'll let you uh, look at this for a second. This article, which is what I used as the basis to construct this very simple radio telescope, will give you every detail on how to set it up, how to set the uh, software, the hardware, where to get the hardware, and uh, how to make it work. And the heart of the system is this uh, RTL-SDR receiver, which is $29.95 on Amazon. Very inexpensive. You can use it for a multitude of uh, uses beyond radio telescopes. It's got uh, direct sampling, so you can use it as a ham radio or a receiver as well. Together with that, you have to get the uh, Newelec Subbird H1 bare bones premium cell filter, which is a low noise amplifier specifically designed for radio astronomy. Okay and it's centered on 1420 megahertz. Now, what you do is you connect this receiver to this LNA or low noise amplifier, and this receiver also has what it's called a bias T. A bias T is a simple term that denotes that not only can you receive RF signal, but you can send DC power to power another item. In this case, when you connect this receiver to this LNA, this receiver will actually power the LNA as it's receiving the signal. That's what a bias T is. Then you buy a tripod, you buy this 2.4 gigahertz, uh, 24 dB parabolic grid antenna. Yes, 2.4 gigahertz. Wait a minute, weren't we talking about 1.4 gigahertz? Yes, and uh, that would be best if there, there was a uh, res uh, antenna that actually had that uh, frequency already set up, a feed horn without frequency, but there isn't any. So you can still use this one here, and the SWR is going to be low enough that it's going to give you some amazing results, like I showed you at the beginning, uh, for this uh, uh, radio little radio telescope, okay? So this is all you need. Remember, go to this. Uh, uh, article, and it's going to tell you how to do it, where to get all the stuff, and uh, how to set up uh, all the programs. Okay, software and computer requirements. As far as the computers, you can use any computers. I would recommend a computer that has a clock frequency of more than 1.4, 1.6 gigahertz, like uh, the uh, little um, uh, uh, computers, mini computers, uh, they usually have a clock of 1.8 gigahertz. 
I would try to get one that has a clock of about 3.8 gigahertz, because remember, this thing is very, very sensitive, and it's going to be able to pick up the spikes of the uh, computer clock. And also, you don't want to have a Wi-Fi uh, feeding to that computer if you can. Uh, if you, you want to feed the internet, if you need to connect it to the internet, I would feed the internet with an Ethernet whenever possible, because once again, yeah, this is a radio telescope and you want to minimize the uh, RF noise uh, uh, as much as you can within limits. Then you're going to have to go uh, to airspy.com and get the SDR, uh, SDR Sharp uh, um, uh, software. And because in order to detect the hydrogen line, we need to use software capable of integrating and averaging uh, many fast Fourier transfer samples over time, which is basically what this uh, IF plug that comes with this receiver will be doing. Averaging the samples reduces re the STR, SDR's quantization noise. In other words, it reduces the noise and increases the SNR, allowing the weak hydrogen line peak to be seen because the galaxy is moving fairly slowly in the sky and you can safely average about five to 10 minutes at a time. And then you have to get Chronolapse. Chronolapse is a little program, which is not being updated anymore, but it's a fantastic little program that uh, will record your uh, display. And you can make movies automatically with it. And once again, that article that I told you about has links to everything that you need. Optionally, you may want to get uh, this program right here, which is called Radio Eyes. It's not free, but it's not very expensive. Radio Eyes is not just a typical sky viewer. It has mappings for radio objects. You can find pulsars. You can, uh, it can help you execute uh, radio observations. It's got a drift scan uh, uh, section where you can actually, with your little uh, $300 radio telescope, you can actually set up a, a drift, uh, a sky drift uh, of the sky, and uh, you can plan it. Great little program, highly recommended. It. It's optional, not needed for what I'm talking about here. Okay, can you upgrade the system? Yes, this is what I did. I first built that system. It wasn't very impressive, but it was very good. And then I added, I went on the internet and I, I bought a 2.1 meter, seven foot uh, dish. And I added for 20 extra dollars, another new Alec, uh LNA, but this one is a wide band NL, LNA. So I have the dish, the Sawbird LNA, low no noise amplifier. And then I added another low noise amplifier, cheaper one, wide band, go into the computer. And these are the results. You can see that the antenna, which is pointing straight up into the sky, it's already beginning to pick up uh, hydrogen uh, transmissions, hydrogen line transmissions right here, even though it's not pointing at anything. It could be pointing at uh, something that I don't know about. And that's where the drift scan uh, portion of the radio ice really comes in handy because it can tell you, hey, you just went over a pulsar. I doubt it you're going to be able to pick up pulsars with this system. But look at this signal. And I don't know if you remember the uh, dBs on the other one was like minus 39. This one's minus 21 now for an increase of 20 dBs. You can begin to visualize the signal right here. And look at this. As we're getting close to the arms of the galaxy, it's beginning to pick up more and more signal in a bump here. You see this bump? how it's moving right here that's the doppler shift we're getting pick, we're picking up different portions of the galaxy as a look at that big signal as the uh power is dropping here uh let me stop this for a second because i want i want to call your attention to this look how powerful the signal is with this 2.1 meter dish same system as before receptor and everything else just one extra L lna and a bigger signal, a bigger dish. And now you can see with radio eyes that we're right over the uh, portion of the uh, of the galaxy. And you can see it over here in Stellarium as well. Look at the signal that it's picking up. And then 
Oh, this is noise from uh, Wi-Fi, homes, uh, garage door openers, and stuff like that. The signal's beginning to fade because we're flying right over the galaxy. Let's go a little further here. Let's go back to the second portion of this video. And you're going to see something amazing here. Doppler effect in action. First of all, here's the sun. You can see, this is a live video, by the way. You can see the sun moving here. And what happened here is that, let me go, let me back it up here for a second. As the sun gets closer to the dish, the signal disappears because it's the hydrogen from the sun. It so affects this uh, radio telescope that you have to change the game. But it appears again. It's getting closer to the galaxy arms, and you're going to see something amazing here. You see that? I'm going to stop it right here. Two peaks. Look at these two peaks right here. Look at this gap right here. This radio telescope is actually picking up two arms, one of which has a higher frequency than the passive frequency 142405, which means that it's coming towards us. The other one has a lower frequency, which means that that arm is actually going away from us. You can see the Doppler effect in action with this little radio telescope. Look at this. And look at it moving. We're passing over this portion here. You can see the hump here as the frequency moves because certain parts, different parts of the uh, galaxy arms are either coming towards us or flying away. You can do all that with this system, less than $300. I'm showing you with the dish here and the extra LNA, which adds another $400, but you don't have to do that. The other system will show it just as well. Well, not just as well, but it will show it. Okay, I'm getting close to my end of time here. Possible science, science applications with this system. Okay, this um, SDR Sharp program in IF plugin also produces uh, spectra which means that it gives you uh, 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 files with the frequency and the flux of what you're receiving, the different frequencies, uh, range, and the flux. So you can add this data. You can actually set it up to give you data beyond that little movie and everything else. So you can use it on certain applications. Uh, spectrum is simply a chart of graph that shows the intensity of light being emitted over a range of energies. Spectra can be produced for energy uh, for any energy of light from low energy radio waves to very high energy gamma rays. I'm a member of the Society of uh, Amateur Radio Astronomers. They have fantastic people there uh, from professional uh, 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 radio astronomers all the way to brand new people who've never built one. And the majority are ham radio operators, one of which is uh, Ted Klein, November Zero, Romeo, Quebec, Victor, who's come up with a program that actually gets the data from this little system and creates, eventually, you can't see it here, but you can, if you let the system run for a month, it will create a complete radio sky map of the Milky Way, which you can do in schools, you can do to, uh, for your own uh, gratification. Okay, now I talked about getting a bigger dish and everything. How do you do that? Well, there's a company on, online called OfferUp, OfferUp.com. I'm talking to people who live in the United States. I don't know how it is. I mean, you can go to eBay, you can go to Amazon and spend thousands of dollars to get a, another um, uh, uh, a dish or something like that. But if you go offer up or you go in the neighborhood, you're going to see a lot of these antennas that people want to get rid of. Uh, like this person wants to get rid of zero dollars. Come pick it up. It's free. And you can build a very cheap feed horn. Feed horn is this thing that goes in the front of the dish for specifically for this frequency, which is what I did. You can build it for uh, five dollars, five to ten dollars, and just go to a uh, Home Depot. You buy a uh, uh, duct reducer, six to eight inches with a cap on the back. You put an end connector with a, an active element, which is a wire about 3.5 centimeters, and it's perfect. And it doesn't have to be polarized because 
uh, hydrogen line comes from, uh, it's completely polarized on all frequencies. You can get a tripod here for $10, you can get another dish for $50, very cheap. Okay, and before I go, before I finish this, because I'm coming to the end here, uh, for those of you really interested in this, I'm only a member, I don't work for the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, I'm a member at large, I'm not a member of the board or anything else, but they're an amazing uh, resource, and I recommend it uh, to everybody, uh, because they have meetings every month, they have Zoom meetings, they have people that can help you, they're very helpful, they even have the... Uh, uh, scope that I was talking about. They sell it right there. And I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to make a commercial out of this, but uh, if you're lazy like me, you can buy it directly from them. They'll send you everything that you need. You're in business. Oh, there he goes. You're in business for uh, less than $300. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, question and answers. That's me uh, 20 pounds ago. I'm losing weight. Thank you very much. It's not easy. Uh, thank you, Eric uh, Guth and QSO today for allowing me uh, to make this presentation. Thank you, Eric, for being so uh, patient with me. Uh, please do tell your wife uh, you deserve it. So go ahead and ask any questions you want. Uh, I'm still not going to get paid if, uh, if I don't know the answers, and I'll either research it or make it up and make it sound good or both. Uh, here you have my contacts, and once again, thank you so much uh, for uh, listening to this uh, presentation. I'm Pablo, if you have any questions or any comments, never done this before. <laughs> this is the time tunnel. I got to go back in time after this. I think your presentation in the other, in the auditorium is over, Pablo. <laughs> So where Here's are you located? Bob. <laughs> Bob Massey. All right. That's a familiar name. Jim WB0 GMR. Hi, Larry. All right, I'm listening to uh and there's Ted Klein, the creator Oscar of Oscar 100 as well. Ted, I hope you don't mind that I mention your name. Uh, we're going to find out. Sounds good, though. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you. So, wow. All these people for my presentation? Mm -hmm. Well, there are, there are great programs on Netflix. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Hey, Pablo, I have a question. Yeah. Right. So you talked briefly about a feed horn. Uh, in some projects that I've seen online, the feed horn is actually a, a very important part, it seems, because it seems to focus, that, like you're mentioning, your, your signal and so on, especially at 1420. So I noticed that the Scope in a Box project there the, in the uh, website for the Radio Astronomy Club doesn't include a feed horn. How much of a hit, my question is, is how much of a hit do you take by not placing this feed horn in front of this parabolic dish antenna? Well, the basic program comes with the uh, Wi-Fi 2.4 gigahertz antenna, and that's all you need. I mean, the dish, it's an addition. I just showed you the basic system, and then I, i as a tinker, I added the, uh, I bought a dish, and then I, I built uh, the feed horn, which is extremely easy to do. Uh, and uh, it basically... Uh, the feed horn is uh, just a duct reducer, uh, six to eight inches with a cap uh, from the end of the cap, about, uh, about eight centimeters. You uh, put an end connector with a wire, which is about, it should be a quarter uh, length, uh, uh, wavelength, 5.3 uh, centimeters, but actually uh, like 4.8 centimeters seems to work be uh, work the best, and I and I actually did it with, uh, it with uh, the SWR was 1.0 all the way. But the basic system, it's all complete. It gives the Wi-Fi antenna is all you need, really. And the feed horn is for the dish because you're going to get a dish. You can get dishes for free. You can get them uh, uh, the uh, uh, foldable dishes. I got a couple of foldable dishes, 2.3 meters for 60 bucks each, 1980s uh, 
uh, vintage. Uh, they work just fine. I don't know if that answers your question, Stephen. Uh, well, Pablo, I, I, could, I could talk to you more, uh, and I guess I will, until somebody cuts me off. Right, so again, going back to the frequent <coughs> question, it seems like it's going ahead and taking the place of this parabolic antenna. So I'm just thinking, yeah, I could order the 295 kit and pretty much just, if you will, just put that uh, 2.4 gigahertz antenna off to the side and build my own Home Depot reducer from eight inches to six inches that you're talking about with that uh, small stub of an antenna at the very base connected with my coax or something like that. Uh, am I way off base? Am I missing something? No, you're not missing anything at all. You're absolutely correct. Uh, you can do that. And that's what I did. I could share my uh, screen right now, but I don't know if I have, can I do that? Because I don't, um, uh, let, me, let me share my screen for a second. And I have the, my radio telescope is working right now live. Uh, let me know if you see it. Do you see it right here? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is the dish right here. This is a live feed. And this is the uh, feed horn that I built. I put a salad bowl on top for when it rains. It works fantastic. Um, and that's all you need, really. Uh, there is a little program that tells you the distance between the feed horn and the parabolic uh, antenna. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be at a certain distance. But really, the H1 line is so powerful that you can actually get it with a 2.4 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi antenna. So, uh, yeah. It, okay. uh, and then it's not an antenna. I thought he said antenna. antenna. No, he said an antenna. Oh, that's cool. I so thinking, this is how the cool kids talk. That's right. I was thinking, oh, wow. Well, that's not where it's extra fiddler levels. Yeah. Um, also, um, what I did here with my system, because I don't want to spend $3,500 for uh, a mount, electronic mount, for another $300, I built an uh, 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 electric mount where I can actually reposition this antenna, in it, which is about 150 feet uh, behind me. And uh, I do have another presentation where I show you how to do it. And it's very simple to do. I have a sensor, a width motion sensor, that it actually tells me where the antenna is heading and the uh, elevation of the antenna. You know, you have to remember that the uh, Wi-Fi antenna, the beam width, it's 27 and a half degrees. So really, you're not going to be able to point it much. With the 2.1 meter antenna, now I have a 6.75 degree uh, beam width so that I can actually position it. I can't track any stars, but I can position it and uh, do a drift, what it's called a drift scan of certain objects. What I'm showing you here, it's a very simple, basic system and for beginners, just to get you uh, motivated. And then eventually, you know, Ted Klein is here. He's a, a professional a radio astronomer. Uh, in fact, he's showing right there, if you see Ted Klein in zero RQV, he's showing you right there the, uh, uh, a drift scan uh, radio map that, I don't know, is that mine, uh, Ted, or is that the one you created? The uh, I'm trying to pull up yours. Uh, that's actually from my backyard. Well, from it's his backyard right there. Much so, more you have as well. Yeah, well, it's basically the same. But uh, he's created a program where you can actually use, get the information from this uh, uh, plug-in and then feed that uh, uh that program. Uh, can you use Linux with this? I don't know. Uh, Linux? Yeah, I, I've got a question. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Um, you are hearing me. I guess. I, you had, you'd mentioned the IF plugin for SDR Play. Uh, is that a, uh, how, how's that work? Is that part of SDR Play or is that a separate download? SDR Play is a program <laughs> that comes with a lot of plugins already built in. Yeah. The article will show you how to install okay. that plugin. It's free okay. and, it, and it's all included. And uh, it, it's a little involved. You have to yeah, modify okay. a couple of files. But if I could do it, <laughs> anybody can do it. Yeah, yeah. I've got SDR Play and all that, but I've never, I, I'm not familiar with that plugin. Okay, so it's a plugin. I'll muck around. I'll find it. Thank well, you. No, no, you don't have to find it. If you go to the article that I told you about, yeah, right. Yeah. it gives you everything. Further, uh -oh. 
Uh, if you don't want to, you know, and I'm not selling anything because I'm not uh, no, I'm okay. a member of the uh, SARA, the uh, Society yeah. of uh, Amateur yeah, I've, Radio I've, Astronomers. I've, I've been a member of that off and on, off and on for 20 years. They sell years. the whole system. You don't have to do anything for 295 bucks. Got it. Okay, one more while I got you online. I don't get a kickback. I should, <laughs> but I don't get it. The uh, Ted that's on here, you said he, and I didn't quite write it down quickly enough, this drift program for plotting and so forth. Can we, how, how do I get a little more information about that program? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, it's called Radio Eyes and uh, it's produced by Jim Sky. And uh, let me put the Radio Eyes, the link, uh, Jim Sky. A fantastic program. I mean, uh, uh, go to radiosky.com. Yeah, I see your note there, Ted. Thanks. That's what I was looking for. There, there's Ted. Okay. Okay. Yeah, guys, help me all you can here. There you go, Radio Sky. Pablo, Amazing a, program, really. Pablo, I have a question. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I'm Dan, AI6XG, and a nice presentation. So I've looked at doing this before. And it always came up after you measure the galaxy and maybe the um, the rotation speed. What else can you do with a radio telescope and after you build it? And don't take the question wrong. I, I think it's a great project, but what else? No, can no, you no. Do that's a, that's a very fair question. With a 2.5 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi antenna, you can't do much other than just uh, detect the uh, rotation of the galaxy and you can visualize the Doppler effect as separate arms move towards you and away from you. And that's pretty much it with a little uh, antenna. With the bigger one, uh, you can start detecting free hydrogen. You know, the nice thing about this program it's that it's a beginner system, which is great for high schools and for visualizing the sky. And also for those who are visual astronomers, when it's raining day, night, and everything else, you can actually get a little bit of astronomy through this. And that's pretty much it. You're not going to be able to get a pulsar, not at this frequency, uh, even with a 2.1 meter uh, antenna, especially if you don't have a tracking mount. Eventually, you can move up. So this is... Uh, a way to get your feet wet so you can start thinking about radio astronomy. And you have to remember that to do serious radio astronomy, um, you uh, need uh, aperture and money. Well, so, well Pablo, uh, you were getting bumps thank you. and you were seeing the bumps move around, uh, even with the small little antenna. And so I think you can start doing some kind of plot like what i'm showing uh it will be uh out of focus perhaps maybe blobbier uh and bigger dishes are, are always more fun but you can start making some of that happen uh, again with a bigger dish you can start plotting lots of stuff and there's a whole lot of learning involved uh, and uh, i'm having a great time with your data actually uh starting to see the different arms and uh, trying to plot some of that as well. So uh, there are other ways we can explore. The main thing is that if you join the, uh, uh, Ted is a very experienced radio astronomer and he creates all his, uh, he's uh, way, way above. So, um, um, and he's a member of SARA and uh, they have excellent resources there. People are extremely, extremely helpful. Uh, and uh, I figure why not show this to the uh, ham radio community because uh, we're tinkers and uh, some of you may be interested and it's not overly expensive. It's something that you can do in one afternoon and you can show your kids and you make little movies that you can put on Facebook and everything else and or you can start doing science just like uh, uh, Ted has uh, uh, just told you. Pablo, Pablo you make some uh, very strong points this is Don here in uh, Spring, Texas. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on a very well presented uh, technical presentation this afternoon. The enthusiasm level and that uh, is great. I think it's reminded me and it should remind us all that 
we can replicate our forefathers. Uh, Route Reber did this as a, a, a that uh, back in uh, you know just uh, during the Second World 1944, I think it was first measurement. You know, I had just as an anecdote the great opportunity as an undergraduate uh, in Canada. Grout was passing through the university that I was attending, and I had the great honor to meet him. Uh, and that he was an older, very distinguished gentleman. Here's my question. <clears throat> um, so I've been interested in radio astronomy for years. Uh, Chad mentioned, and you mentioned, alluded fact that what measurements can we make? You know, software and, and processing has really come of age with digital computers and processing and an advancing signal to noise with stacking. And, and I won't go into the details, it will far too long. My question regard when we start looking at digging out finer information, you know, buried in noise or, or, or with signal to noise limitations of these smaller aperture arrays, what about frequency stability of the system? Has that been a concern to you, Pablo, and your team of saying, look, we're looking at the hydrogen line, but, you know, these STR radios do have finite drift. And particularly when we're integrating measurements over a period of time, uh, as as example that Ted is indicating, could that be uh, a bit problematic with uh, both uh, frequency and phase uh, modulation just due to the to, due to the oscillator? I mean, uh, your comments, Pablo. Well, that's a great question, and I'm not a scientist, and I'm not a professional radio astronomer. And it goes to another question somebody posted on the chat. I tried several SDR receivers, and the RTL SDR seems to be the best. In fact, I tried uh, Nulek. God bless them. They're great people and everything else, but it didn't uh, measure up to the other one as far as stability, uh, uh, gain, SNR, and, or anything else. As far as stability, uh, I, I would not, I don't know the answer to that because I'm not, uh, maybe Ted will, would have, but this is just a beginner system and uh, it has been stable as far as my uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, I'm not that really that advanced. So uh, for scientific work, I don't know. Ted, what do you think uh, as far as scientific work? Uh, it depends how far your science goes. You may not get paid for this. Uh, that's why we're amateurs. Uh, it was good enough for MIT Haystack to recommend using an RTL receiver. We're just really doing intensity coming from the sky, whether that's power, or voltage, whatever you want to call it, um, however you want to measure it there. And uh, that's just fine in this general realm. Uh, I think it's quite frequency stable, if you wish. Uh, when you get into uh, a bigger dish and you start worrying about pulsars, that's where frequency stability actually starts caring. Uh, and I've been a little misrepresented by Pablo. He's very kind. Uh, I've only been doing this about two years. Uh, so catch up with me. Well, um, having said that, you're still way more advanced than me. As far as uh, uh, RTL SDR for this kind of a project is stable enough. Uh, I've tried other SDR receivers and uh, they don't seem to measure up uh, for some reason. I don't know what it is. Um, and uh, the uh, the uh, SNR is not as, as good. The signal, the amplification is not as good uh, for for this system. Any other SDR that I've used? Hey, Pablo, Pablo, you, Pablo you mentioned Ted. I, I really applaud and th thank you. I think those are absolutely correct answers. I agree with them. We utilize you know the the tools available and and excellent work, uh, both Pablo and and with the support of Ted. I'm I'm very very impressed. Thank you very much. And by the way, I stand corrected. It's it's growth Reber, not Reber. I, I kept on Reber. I apologize. So. Yeah, it's it's saying, but uh, uh, it, that was uh, my goodness, uh, forty five years ago. So uh, <laughs> I mean, my memory is 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 not uh, is not as good as my computer's memory these days. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But it, it's Reber. Okay. Hey Pablo, you mentioned two different LNAs. There was the one that was a filter for 21 centimeter and then a wideband one. I thought you said you got better results with the wideband one. Was that with the dish or was that the same uh, same system? Okay, same let's antenna. go back to the basic system. The basic system you want to use a Salbert LNA, which is specifically designed for uh, astronomical uh, radio astronomy purposes. 
However, I tried it with the $20 Nualec wideband and it actually works and it works very well. And I'm talking about with a little antenna. So if you don't have a lot of money and you want to spend instead of $40, $20, you can do that. But what I did is I went from the dish, I added an, another LNA in line. So I went from the dish to the Sawbird or the radio astronomy LNA powered through five volts externally. You have three ways to power these LNAs, but you can only use one. So that one is powered through a five volt power supply. Then I immediately connected the wideband LNA and that one is powered by the bias T. As I said before, bias T is a fancy name where the SDR actually is powering the LNA directly through the same port that your uh, the uh, uh, radio frequency comes through. Basically, it powers the LNA. And I got an extra 20 dBs out of that, and I'm getting a tremendous plot. So, yeah, you can use it in line. And I'm thinking about buying another, uh, uh, spending another 40 bucks to uh, uh, to get another Sawbird LNA and see if I can do uh, half better results. My eventually, I want to detect one pulsar. That's my my goal. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do it at uh, probably at 1.4 gigahertz because pulsars are very weak at this frequency. But uh, uh, the 408 megahertz, uh, you can get pulsars that are 200 Janskis, which is very powerful. Uh, but 1.4 gigahertz, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it without tracking because you got to track. And I don't have a tracking. I can move the mount. I can show you later on because I constructed a system. I can move the uh, antenna in every direction, but I can't track yet. That's very expensive. Question, since you've got a couple of uh, LNAs at the antenna, at the feed, uh, do you is the SDR itself is it at the feed or do you say well I got enough signal now I can you understand my question great question uh, absolutely yeah. and the uh, here's the feed horn for my antenna I have the LNA connected mechanically to it uh, the other LNA connected mechanically to it and the SDR which gets very hot connected to it placed on top of the feed horn, which is metal, and I use it as, uh, as a heat sink. It works. And, and then the output of the SDR, it, it, that's a lower frequency and an IF of some kind? The output of the SDR is USB. Now, I have been... Oh, very, oh, so it's actually USB. Yeah, and I've oh, been very oh, unsuccessful. Of course, well, of course it would be, of course, yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. It yeah. Is, I, I, have been, I have been very unsuccessful at extending USB. People tell me that uh, I've used active uh, yeah. uh, USBs, but for some reason, this SDR, I hear that it needs some sort of a, uh, a pulse. Uh, uh, yeah, I understand. To work. Yeah, anyway, they, the spec so what, what I did is I, something, yeah. yeah, so what I did is I placed the computer at the bottom of the- uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> wait a minute, I use high technology to protect it from the weather. Yeah, a rain, an umbrella. No, a doghouse. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what they call the antenna building under broadcast transmitters where and they're turning. I got, I got a $100 PC that I got on Amazon, Windows 10 PC. And uh, with... Uh, house. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I put it inside of a Petco uh, plastic uh, doghouse with a fan to keep it cool. It works. Hmm. Pablo. In fact, let me show you here. Let me show the screen once again. You see the doghouse right here? Right here. Um, can you see it? Yeah. Uh, for the rain, because everything is exposed here, I, I put a... Um, um, salad bowl right here which is attached and it works see it's working uh, full time right now uh, i'm recording with uh with this program oh, somebody's making noise there somebody's slurping 
Yeah, Roy N zero I G or R G. Please mute your microphone. There he goes. Oh, okay. Um, this is this is a program Chronolapse, which is recording this whole screen, and I'm recording every fifteen seconds. Um, and this is the uh, radio eyes. Let me. Uh, There we go. And um, you can get a, a um, Driscan table for a meridian transit. I'm going to generate the table right now. And it tells me that uh, these objects are going to pass through the beam of my antenna at what altitude, which is 90 degrees, which is straight up right now. It's going to enter at 0822 uh, Zulu, exit 0854, and the flux 20 Janskis. It's 3C139.1. So you can do that with that program. It's an amazing program. Um, so you can do a little science with this. Um, so, Pablo, how are you logging into that remote PC? Uh, splash top. Uh, which is TeamViewer, splashed up. It, it's a different type of TeamViewer, cheaper. Um, also, since I have a computer there, I can actually move the antenna. I'm going to go ahead and uh, resume here and uh, look at the dish. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's an that's a fifty dollar actuator. It's this actuator right here and a USB uh, Pololu uh, actuator. <laughs> Wait a minute, but I want to know where it's pointing. Okay, a thirty five dollar wit motion. This is the angle. Up is zero. Fifteen. Uh, or 90 degrees minus 15, that's 75 degrees up right now. In fact, well, let me show you here. Let me know if you want me to stop, okay? Look at the angle Y. That's 20, about 20, that's at uh, 70, uh, 70 degrees above the horizon or 20 degrees off the zenith. I can keep going. And that's a sensor. So that's a sensor that's mounted on the antenna itself. It's reading back in real time where it really is. It's mounted away from the antenna on a wooden pole, uh, which I'm going to show you. It's right about here to okay. keep it away from the steel. Well, yeah, I understand. But if I went out there and physically moved that around, those numbers would change. It's not like it's counting steps on a stepper or something. That is correct. It's not yeah. very accurate. It's not very scientific, but it's good enough for me for 35 yeah. bucks. Yeah, it's a little little like having a, yeah. Anyway, it's ringing in real time and not counting steps or something on a stepper. That's yeah, correct. Cool. It's not, it's cool. not scientifically accurate. Eh, that's close enough. Um. Well, I was going to show you the, okay, there's the asthma. See it, see it moving right there? It's probably more accurate than the beam width of that dish anyway, you know? <laughs> it's exactly right. That's exactly right. And for my needs at this point in my radio astronomy career, to get me to study everything and to learn, it's more than I needed. It cost me 300 bucks uh, for this I created this mount myself. A couple of fence posts right here. This is a harbor uh, freight uh, little uh, uh, mount for 29 bucks. Yeah, a lot like a jack stand, it looks like, or something. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, it's, a, it's not very expensive. And uh, there he goes. Oh, God, yeah. Move, so I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this. The 
the great thing about this is that it doesn't matter if it rains. This thing keeps plugging along. It's a lot of fun for me. Okay, let me stop the share. Any other questions? Beam width is mostly a function of dish diameter. That's correct. And there's a program that if you send me an email, I'll find it. Uh, um, I should have it here, but I have so many screens. But it's a little program that I can uh, um, send to you. And uh, it'll you just put the uh, diameter, the frequency, and it'll tell you what the beam width is going to be based on the uh, based on all the parameters, very simple. There's a lot of support for this. Um, Pablo? Yeah. This is uh, Mark K9GX, I'm your moderator. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Uh, Hi. Have you, uh, are there any optical telescope mounts that could, I, I got in late, I'm having internet problems, I'm sitting here at the base of this antenna. Are there any optical telescope mounts or tracking things that you could use uh, uh, for that at all? Well, you can use a telescope mount, but the only problem is that they're not uh, weather resistant. Uh, right. And, and uh, to, you really need to have this uh, system uh, on for hours, for days, for months. Uh, so yeah, you can use any uh, any mount. Uh, for example, the uh, this dish is about hundred pounds. I see. Uh, a Los Mandy uh, mount. Uh, I just found right. out that uh, my CG Pro has been discontinued and unsupported by Celestron. So if it ever breaks, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm gonna have to fix it myself. But we're talking about four thousand dollars, and they have special mounts for radio astronomy, which is about which are about three thousand dollars and five hundred dollars shipping and all of that stuff i'm not at that level yet i mean uh, i can't justify spending that kind of money that's why i created this cheapo system uh for my uh just to get my feet wet and uh just to uh learn because i'm learning a lot just by actually doing have you hooked up at all with like at a local astronomy club or anything like that uh or, or a, a, a regular uh, optical observatory out, out there. I don't know, where, where are you in California? I have my own private uh, uh, roll off roof, fully automated, fully power uh, protected, weather protected uh, observatory. Well, I'm, coming, I'm coming over to your house then. <laughs> yeah, and I do uh, observations every night. I do uh, observations for uh, the NASA uh, test program where I uh, uh, basically, we, we get the data, I get the data and then I reduce it and I send the results to professional astronomers. I do uh, NEO work for the Minor Planet Center and uh, some other stuff that I do. So yeah, I'm, I'm connected. Since, since you're doing this citizen astronomy thing at this real introductory level, get our feet wet radio telescope, uh, is there a way at this level to contribute to that vast data or is this, yeah, we need to go another notch up or two to get a better system to really. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I would hi highly suggest you uh, join uh, Sarah, uh, the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, because uh, they have all kinds of projects at all levels. I mean, some of the people there have 25 meter uh, dishes and access. Yeah, right, right. To understand. Uh, and uh, like um, Ted Klein, um, I mean, he's uh, creating uh, all kinds of programs to uh, get some data out of this. Um, I doubt it we're going to be able to make discoveries using these uh, amateur systems. You never know. Um, they, they don't have the resolution, I don't think. Uh, but it's satisfying to actually corroborate what radio astronomers are uh, telling us. And uh, it's, it's a simple way of doing it, mainly for fun in my case. Oh, yes, for fun. But, but uh, 
uh, in this day and age, uh, just data harvesting, just want lots and lots and lots and lots of data. And even though we may not discover anything new, we are putting one more little dot on the chart. You know? That's correct. And that's where Ted Klein comes in. And I don't know if there's going to be a data repository like the American Association of Variable Start Observers, which they have uh, a repository. And maybe they'll, they, somebody will eventually create it. But uh, Ted, uh, as you can see, his displays are having a, a yes, I do ground-based follow-up producing light curves for uh, the test program. So basically test uh, detects a possible transit, and then uh, with my uh, telescope, I uh, I observe it for hours, and then uh, using Astro Image J, I reduce and create light curves and send it. And same with uh, ty uh, uh, with Minor Planet Center discovering uh, uh, asteroids. So this is one aspect of what I do. A little aspect. <laughs> Radio astronomy is not easy and it's very expensive. Can I ask you a frivolous question? Yeah, please. Have you uh, have you seen the Reber dish uh, at Green Bank? No, I've never been to Green Bank. I've seen it in pictures. Uh, yeah, I, I was there. It's it's pretty impressive to think just this young guy did this with no, you know, we, we yeah. build that now with the background. We kind of know where we're going. He was just taking a shot in the dark. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he got no help from anybody. Yeah, like it seemed a Model T engine to run the thing or something to drive it. It was uh, right, pretty... right, right. Absolutely. Well, I've been there and done that. Uh, well, I got to go. I've got a presentation. Uh, I was your moderator tonight, uh, Pablo, and uh, it's great meeting you. And I hope we can have an eyeball QSO one of these days. And uh, I've got to do a terrestrial presentation now on uh, on ham radio. So I got to scoot. Do you want me to quit now, or or I can no, no, continue? No, no, you go. You go ahead. I I, I just got I, I got here at like five thirty five because I'm having uh, uh, I'm having five uh, G problems. I've got no internet, so I'm actually sitting here in my car looking at the uh, the T Mobile tower here. So no, you you go ahead. Uh, I'm going to go check out my presentation because I. Uh, uh, I, I, I dropped mine in. Uh, I dropped it in the box this morning about 10 a.m. I was up all night uh, getting it ready. So uh, and I want to see yours uh, when it plays back. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. And I'm going to wait in a few minutes so they can uh, see your presentation, uh, maybe in a couple of minutes or something like that. Uh, yeah, you could use the Dobsonian telescope to drive the dish. It's an out awesome as um, so it's it's not a. It, 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 for a radio telescope, you need uh, altitude and azimuth. And, uh, right, right. Well, did, and somebody did, asked about my mount. It's a CG Pro for the C14. Um, wasn't Groat's telescope like a like a big donut or something? Uh, mount. Uh, no, no, no. That oh, was it. Was uh, it was uh, it rotated? It was an Azel. It had okay. a track that went around and then a way to lift it up. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty damn clever. I mean, considering he had no real background in this, you know, absolutely. No, he created it. He invented it because nobody's used. I mean, yeah, the, yep. the same model is being used today. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And yep. he created it. <laughs> yeah, a ham radio operator. Yep, W nine G F Z. Right. So yeah, I think that's the call that the club in uh, West Virginia used. No, in no, uh, the no, 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 it's in Socorro. The, v for those, the VLA, the VLA, VLA uses that club. For those of you who want uh, uh, me to send you the uh, program, can you send me an email? Because I'm going to forget unless I, uh, uh, my email is uh, Pablo TWA1 at gmail.com. It's on the chat right there. Uh, no, I went to Scott. I want to go to everyone. I found all your information in the, your, uh, I found your PowerPoint in the, uh, uh the, the 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 you know the correlated data or whatever they call it there too so i've got that so uh, uh i can't wait to see the whole presentation where are you in california i'm in uh, la county uh city of glendora two blocks of okay Maine. okay well i i was born in long beach and grew up in orange county so i know where you uh, are yeah, yeah. <laughs> by west covina you know right right i call yeah. glendora the gateway to rancho cucamonga uh, well, I worked at a radio station in Rancho Cucamonga. Well, there you go. 1510. All right. Oh. <laughs> Pleasure meeting you. Pleasure meeting you. Thank you for attending the uh, 
From 73, wouldn't it wouldn't have missed it. I wish I gotten here, but I'll I'll look at the video playback. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Anybody 73. Else? Bye bye. 73. Anybody else has any questions or yeah. Yeah, the actuator said Pololu. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Hello, Marty K1FQL. Hi, Marty. Um have you have you tried cooling the preamp? Uh no, I haven't, but that would be a great idea. Uh, there are there are these little thermoelectric coolers. Uh, they they're low voltage, but they do draw a lot of current. Um, yeah, and I have a little refrigerator right here in this uh, office based on that uh, thermoelectric uh, model, and that's a wonderful idea. Actually. Yeah, they're not they're not terribly expensive. You you need to get fairly close to where the where the device is. I'm not sure what the technology is in the preamp, whether it's gallium arsenide or silicon. Um, but if, certainly if it's gallium arsenide, you might benefit a little bit if you're in a warm climate, which I think you are. Um, you might Especially pick up. Today. You might uh, pick I, up. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if just packing some dry ice in it just to see what the heck happens. That uh, that might make the preamp unstable, or oh, some, or it might crack depending on how it's done. <laughs> that might be too far, huh? I think you might want to cool it down more slowly. Okay, yeah, just a, just a, just a thought. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's um, a great idea, and that's one of the projects uh, experimentations that I'm gonna I'm gonna make uh, mm -hmm. cooling it. Uh, hey, Mark's back. What's what's well, what is? Yeah. I'm trying so, to check yeah. out. <laughs> the uh, somebody asked me about the actuators. Uh, the uh, elevation actuator. It's a linear actuator. You can get them on eBay. Even I have a 30 inch actuator for the elevation, and that one is uh, about uh, 70 bucks on eBay. It works great, and you can drive it with a simple motor controller. Pololu simple motor controller. I think they're like 20 bucks, uh, USB connected, and, uh, and you're in business. Uh, the motor for the azimuth uh, for my dish, it's a $14.50 motor, 12 volt motor, uh, which is connected to a sprocket, which I put a bigger sprocket uh, around the, uh, oh, the mount is based on a the front wheel axle of a Chevy Impala. So the dish on the pole, the pole goes on the uh, front wheel axle. And then I put a sprocket around it and chain to the little motor. You don't need a lot of power once you got it on an axle. And I drive it with a $20 Pololu uh, controller. It works great. Um, as you saw before, yeah, I forgot to tell you that's that's the heart of my mount, the uh, Chevy Impala uh, uh, front axle, front wheel axle. Uh, that was thirty dollars. I I didn't invent these things. I just got it from some other uh, people around the internet. I go, that's a great idea. Let's implement that. So. Eventually, I'm going to spend four grand and uh, get a real mount and do some serious, but not at this point, you know, cryogenics. Yeah, so. Um, Pablo, we were talking about temperature sensitivity. Uh, this is actually your data. That flat spot on the left is at night where you cool down to a pretty stable temperature, apparently. Uh, but during the day on the right, you can see the sun warms up and uh, reduces your amplitude gain uh, in a various way, depending on the clouds going by and everything else. And so, yeah, there are issues with that. But we can play with calibration and get rid of a whole lot of that. Um, so that's another stage we can get into. Uh, there's, there's so many fun things to explore in radio astronomy. It includes a lot of mechanical, as Pablo was just describing, along with the software along with all the electrical. It's great fun. Um, 
Anything and, else? And you, here's here's your other data. Free, so your feel world. free to add anything you want, Ted, because uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I did. Um, I, I think that would be my next step to add some cryogenics to it. Um, there you go. Uh, also, the uh, Sawbird LNA comes with a um, built-in dummy load, 50 ohm dummy load, dummy load that you can actually, and I also have another USB switch, which I remotely activate that dummy load. So I can create a dark uh, sub um, with no signal whatsoever. And then I can reconnect the antenna remotely. And that's already built in. And all you need is to have a switch. You have to turn it on and turn it off. But uh, uh, Marty, your uh, your microphone. Oh, so so it's it's like a radiometer in a sense. You can switch to the the dummy load and get a cal off of that. Yeah, to calibrate it. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing you could do with a TE cooler is uh, you could put it in a just a simple motor bridge circuit. Um, and you can, um, you could do two things. You could put a thermal sensor on your, your preamp. Uh, there are ones that analog devices make that put out like one microamp per degree Kelvin. Um, and um, you could put that in a servo loop to uh, stabilize the temperature of whatever you're operating day and night. And uh, it's just a simple, I think you can buy a motor reversing bridge circuit. You know, it's just uh, probably a couple of Darlington pairs. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, TE cooler sits between the, just as the motor would sit, you know, in the circuit to reverse the direction. And you can enclose that in a, in a just a simple uh, first order thermal loop and uh, servo loop and uh, control the temperature to probably a degree or something like that. Um, to whatever oh. temperature you choose, of course you have to, you know, put the hot side of the tea cooler somewhere on a heat sink and radiate that away. That's no problem at night. During the day, it's more of a problem. And, uh, you know, little styrofoam doesn't weigh very much. Uh, I've done all this, by the way, for car radar sitting in front of the radiator on a car. Um, and it worked? Was, yeah, that was the solution to keep uh, a 76 gigahertz oscillator at a constant temperature year round, you know, in winter and in summer, was to uh, insulate the oscillator and put a TE cooler, you know, in proximity to it where I could, I had a summer winter switch. Um, oh. I wouldn't want to pay your power bill. Uh, T cooler <laughs> runs around 11 amps, uh, you know, two volts or whatever the voltage is for the junction. But uh, it's it's probably a lot easier to to do it that way than it is to have a doer of nitrogen or <laughs> or a block of dry ice. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm gonna get on it. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a TE and see if I can uh, control the temperature a little bit. Uh, uh, Ted, do you think that'd be useful for this little system? Well, uh, I'm not sure for your little system. We're doing some kind of advanced testing uh, and research just for fun. And we've been doing that all summer with uh, four STEM students. And it's it's a lot of fun education. Um, it takes the heat and pushes it someplace else. And now your someplace else has to get rid of the heat. And so now we have a water... High, uh, radiator attached to it and water flowing through it and the water in the bucket sure enough gets warm after an hour or so um, yeah, yeah. because you're putting in you know 30 watts it has to go someplace um, and so what we're trying to do is get stability not so much cooling uh, that graph I showed you before showed the temperature sensitivity um, and if we could just make it stable we thought maybe that would improve things uh, it's a work in process. Yeah, um, that, that's exactly what I had to do with the 76 gigahertz VCO. I had to keep it at roughly 50 degrees C year round 
including the winter. And um, I was able to do that to within probably a degree. If it's a first order servo loop, you can't, you can't go to the null with it. If you have a higher order loop, you probably could uh, control so it you, better. You, you, might, you might give up a little bit of raw sensitivity in order for it to be constant. You know, you might actually heat it up a little on a really cold day. Yeah. Even though it may be less sensitive, at least it's going to be the same. Right. You want to keep it, if you're making measurements, you want to keep yep. the conditions constant. Right, right. Yeah, depending, depending on what you're doing. If you're chasing DX, you want really good sensitivity. But if you're doing some science, you want a constant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, extremely cold where I live is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where people start complaining and crying. And yeah, unfortunately, in California, the fires, it's a lot warmer than that in parts of the state now. Yeah. yeah, I get fires two blocks away from here sometimes. Yeah, it's tragic. Yeah. I lived in L.A. back in the uh, late 70s. Uh, I worked at Hughes Aircraft, huge air crash yeah. in uh, Culver City before they, uh, they turned all those buildings into condominiums. They, t they raised uh, Howard Hughes's hangar to the ground and, and uh, built up uh, condos over there. So. Excellent. Uh, Ted, do you, is there anything you wanna add to uh, maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing because you're two years more advanced than me? And, and that's all I want to emphasize. Uh, I, I'm just a step ahead of you. Uh, it's just no, so you're fun not. learning all this stuff. Uh, I just think it's a kick that uh, with small antenna, you can get something. And if you can get that data into a file, we have that way with that article, um, either on Linux or on Windows. Uh, then you start playing with the data and uh, hooray for... Uh, simple software programming, and we're just making things happen with Python. Um, I want to help folks if I can, and that's why I keep showing the graphs, that's all. Uh, come help me develop this Python so that we can get beginners interested. Well, what's, what's the smallest dish you might need to receive uh, a Pulsar? The order I'm of, having you know, trouble order with uh, a, 50, a 16 foot dish. That's, but it, that's, could be, it could be my noisy environment. I think that has a lot to do with it. So uh, that's probably more important than the dish. That's why we have a radio quiet zone in West Virginia. Uh, they like them out on Antarctica uh, and Chile. You know, there are reasons for this. And you need a tracking mount too. I say not. Uh, I, I can get lots and lots of data by just drift scanning. And uh, once a day, I will hit the spot that you want just by changing the elevation. And if I want a little bit higher, then it might take a couple of days or a week. And I can get that data as well. Um, so Even for a Pulsar? Can, uh, with yours, you can do it. Oh, well, Pulsar, that's a little different. Yeah. Well, that's what uh, I was talking about, a Pulsar. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, I am trying, uh, I think it's my environment that's noisy. Uh, if your dish is big enough, you can get it quickly and let it, uh, you know, within the 15 minutes or so. Of course, if your dish is big, then your beam width is small. So they're fighting each other. Uh, I don't know. There are uh, folks that do it, uh, have detected pulsars with uh, corner reflectors. And that's a very simple kind of antenna. Um, it's all on the web. I haven't seen a lot of people do it though. So it's still tough. Yeah, detecting a pulsar with a amateur astronomy is kind of the holy grail. They're really, really hard to do. You've got a good system when you, you can actually detect one. Absolutely. I'm finding that out, yeah. I yeah, agree. yeah, that's, it's tough. But not at 408 megahertz, but you can't use a dish for that. You can, uh, well, I guess you could, but uh, I hear that uh, pulsars at uh, 408 mega, megahertz, uh, they're very, very uh, energetic. And uh, you can, not easily, but you can pick them up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some pictures here. Let's see. I agree that lower frequencies are stronger. Roger, you had a point to make, I think. 
Yeah, as a uh, definite rank novice, this is something I've been interested in for many years, but have never really pursued it much. I have a, a, a very simple question. You were talking about using the 2.8 gigahertz dish at 1.4. Is it necessary to change the feed point, focus point? No. And okay. that's the, the beauty of it's 2.4 gigahertz. It's that's the beauty because you can get them for 50 bucks. You can get them for free, actually. Um, but uh, no, it, actually, the system works. And it was tested by a semi professional radio astronomer in Germany. This guy, uh, Wolfgang, uh, he is a member of a, a large radio astronomy community, and he, he's really a whiz at this and he tested the system and he said, no, nah, it's not gonna work. And he was surprised that it actually worked so well, even with a 2.4 gigahertz uh, antenna with the highest WR. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, I agree it would be inefficient, but it also works. So, okay. Yeah, that's the beauty of the system. It's, I mean, if you get the parts, you can get them for free someplace. I mean, you go to OfferUp or eBay and you can get them for nothing except for the LNA and the SDR and you in the computer and you're in business. You can actually get this. Oh, no, another quick question because I might have to run here in a minute. One thing we got a thunderstorm coming through. But anyway, uh, how much computing power does this require? It didn't seem to take a whole lot. Uh, the SDR right now, I have uh, a $100 refurbished Amazon Windows 10 uh, <laughs> AMD computer running at 3.3 3. Uh, gigahertz, and it's at 80% CPU, and I have a display. Uh, the core temperature right now is 64 Fahrenheit to the maximum of 158, so I still have 64 uh, and it's got eight gigabytes of RAM and I'm using 3.2 gigabytes of RAM. The answer, you can do it with a $100 computer. <laughs> what I would caution you, if you can, get a computer with a clock higher than one. Most Raspberry Pis and all those little computers, they usually the clock runs at 1.8, which is extremely close to 1.4. And this is a very... Uh, uh, but they still work, but you're gonna see some spikes. Uh, but I chose a computer on Amazon that is 3.4 gigahertz clock far away uh, from in the harmonics do not seem to bother it, it. And so far. And uh, yeah, four gigabytes of RAM, any old computer. The SDR is a, the uh, the SDR sharp the program that's the uh, hog, but it works. Uh, I use really ancient old computers that folks threw out. Uh, nothing fancy. Uh, his software is taking a reading every hundred and eighty seconds. Uh, this isn't that hard, or at least it's writing a file. Yeah. Uh, you can do it uh, if. Instead of going on the Windows, uh, Linux is free. The software on Linux is free. Uh, it collects even better. So all these roadkill computers are great. Yeah, since I got you guys here, let me share uh, the screen here. And I'm going to show you something funny. Share. Um, Uh, here we go. Um, hold on a second. You see this? I see many pictures. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I should have appeared right now. This is the uh, axle. Uh, and this is the motor that runs the uh, azimuth. This is the actuator right here. I built it all myself. Um, oh, 
Here we go. Uh, you should be able to see it now. That's the uh, feed horn. Super highly sophisticated. Built with a reducer right here and a cap on top of that. Drilled a hole, put, put, I placed the uh, N, uh, female N uh, receptacle here. And I'm gonna show you, okay, here's the uh, LNA, the Saubert. This is the white band LNA. Let me see if I have it. Can, can you see it? Can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me see. Looks, like, I... a, looks like a flower pot. Yeah. <laughs> are, are uh, the, is, is, is the LNA outside of that can? It looked like you were pointing to something that was outside, out in the... Yes, it is. It's outside. Okay. Yeah. It's, okay, um, there. Oh, there. That, that one where your cursor is, that, that we can see the antenna. The little E-feel, E-probe there. Yeah. That's uh, cool. I've never soldered metal before, so I had to learn how to do it badly. Yeah. Um. It is the back of that uh, solid? You know, it looks kind of pinkish it's, colored. This is this is a cap. I bought the cap for this. It's metal, a metal cap, right? Yeah, it's a, it's the uh, whatever the cap is. Yeah, it's a conductor. <laughs> you got it. Look how badly I solder this. I'm oh, that's okay. First, that's cool. That was my first attempt soldering ever. It, it's hard as hell to solder that kind of stuff. You did good. Yeah. I mean, and it, it works like a charm. The uh, SWR was 1.0, let me see it. Uh, oh, no. okay, here's a better, where is it? Oh, here we go. How'd you measure SWR, like a, a VNA or something? Yeah. Okay. I have a picture someplace. I wasn't prepared because I, I didn't think anybody was gonna ask me about this. No, that's okay. Uh, well, the hardcore guys are hanging in here, you know. <laughs> There's something wrong with the with us. <laughs> here you go. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, beautiful. And this is without the second one. And this is an older iteration. Uh, but basically, uh, I got the LNA here, another LNA here, the SDR yeah. right here. Um, that's got some tenths of loss with those adapters. Right. That's going to increase oh. your noise temperature. Here you go. Nano VNA. Right oh, here. Nano VNA. Yeah. You can't see it, but it's a flat line. No, I cut it right for the, exactly for the frequency. Yeah. In fact, with this thing pointed at the sky, you'll probably be able to detect the uh, hydrogen line just with this. Yeah. In fact, may even be better than the 2.4 gigahertz antenna, just this. Pointed at the sky. How, how did you determine the distance to the back short? The distance from the the bottom of the can to the pro that's the right. back short distance right there's a program that i use for that but basically i just i guessed it um um but there's a an equation that you can use right you need the guide the quarter guide wavelength that's normally where you put it yeah right um I don't know where I got it from, but I do have a program somewhere. I wasn't prepared for that because this is just a super beginner presentation. Uh, so I didn't have that material material ready for you. Sorry. Oh, 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 I forgot to tell you guys. Uh, Roger, see, this is the antenna. Oh, you yeah. screen, put a little screen on it. Okay, so I put chicken wire on it. Uh, that, uh, quarter inch for that frequency is great. That wow. increases the SNR tremendously, actually. This alone. Now, I tried aluminum foil, which is great for cooking meat if you need it. But 
it actually it did not work as well as the uh, as this. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and this is the sensor right here. Very highly sophisticated oh, yeah, attachment yeah. point right here. Uh -huh. A piece of wood away from metal <clears throat> to give me the most accurate reading. And it's pretty accurate within a couple of degrees. And this one has a beam width of 6.7 degrees. So, you know, I can point it at stuff. Uh, remind us again the sensor. What what's which what is it? What was it called? Let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, you told us, and I jotted it down somewhere, but I can't read. My no, no, name. no. Don't worry. I got I got pictures for you. I was ready to. Uh, I'm going to show you all that. Um, That's what that is. A duct producer. Yeah, this is a duct <laughs> producer right here. Nine dollars and fifty eight cents. With the cap, seven bucks. Um, it's a, it's called Wit Motion. Oh, here we go. Universal bench grinder stand, twenty nine ninety five. You drill some holes, you stick it in there with concrete. Now I've never worked with concrete before, but there is a great invention. Let me show you. For guys like me. Um, Quick creep. <laughs> I never heard of it. You don't, you don't have to mix it. You don't have to mix this. You put the uh, bench grinder in the hole. You pour that dry, and then you pour a gallon of water on it. You got concrete. I've used hundreds of pounds of. <laughs> but this is the right kind. You don't have to mix it. Um. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I've got I've got lots of fence posts put up with that stuff. You stick it in, dump it in, put some water in it, and move on, move on with your life. It works great. Uh, simple motor controller. Um. The, uh, this is the motor for the azimuth motor, 15 bucks. Because once you put it on the axle, really, you don't need a lot of torque. Um, USB switch, 15 bucks. That's for the... Uh, LNA's 50 ohm switch. So you can activate it remotely. Very basic system. Um, now for the uh, sensor, let me find something here. Hold on a second. Uh, I think your sensor was just under the last one you touched. Go back to that one. Underneath. Oh, yes, thank you. As you can see better. Man, I quit flying for the airlines just in time. My eyesight is going. Here we go. Comes with the program. And it works great. That's for getting your azimuth angle? It's uh, all three angles, heading, oh. altitude, everything. Oh. Wow. Yeah, it's three axes. Oh, yeah, I see. Has it got a compass then or something? Does it's got a magnetic, yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, and you can calibrate it. Uh, Oh, oh yeah, you can even calibrate for where north is and yada yada yada. Yeah, it's it, it's going to be magnetic north, so you got to know the well, variation of yeah your yeah. But but that's it's sensing. Yeah, okay. As long as it's got some something that knows, 
the, the smooth My variation right is there. 13 degrees here in Los Angeles. So yeah, that, that you just factor that out. That's not a big deal. Yeah. That's cool. So I can go to radio eyes and uh, I can point the antenna in any direction within a couple of degrees. And I didn't have to spend four grand to do it. That's amazing. I didn't know this instrument existed for such a low price. God, yeah. Uh, I got an integrated circuit for an Arduino that could sense elevation, and it cost about ten, five bucks or something. Yeah, but this one but comes this with does, a... Yeah, this is nice. I'm, I'm going to bother with it. This has got all this hard stuff done for me. It's got the <laughs> software, too. Oh, so, yeah, that'd be, oh, that'd be cool. And in aviation, let me let me share this side. How do I share that? Now, that beats the hell out of putting a... Uh, some kind of a you know motor and choppers and crap out there on the antenna. This just tells you where you're pointing. Close enough, you know. Close enough. With that instrument and a GPS receiver, you could build a guided missile. No, <laughs> I you, you could, yeah. You'd have yeah. you'd have all degrees of freedom. Yeah, just yeah. don't tell the North Koreans that. Yeah. There was a guy that had a do-it-yourself guided missile that he was building online. You know, he laid up the fiberglass and built the airframe, and I think it was in Australia, and the, the government took his site down. <laughs> I guess he was going to use a ramjet engine. He had everything oh specified, and they took it down. <laughs> I got to mount it better because it's a little bit... Uh, can you see this? Yeah. So um, what do I want to do here? Oh. Well, it's good enough. Okay. Do you guys have any more questions or anything you want to share? I assume that all this is going to be available somewhere. Yeah, it's all, your slides are online already. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, can, I, I can send you the, uh, well, no, it's already there. Actually, you can download the PDF of the uh, presentation. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I think right now, I think just the way this set up, if you scroll down, you can eventually actually play the replay right now. But I don't think they record this Q&A stuff. I think it's only the talk. Well, That's when I first tuned in, it said it was being recorded. Okay. Oh, so maybe, maybe all this crap we're doing right now gets recorded okay well, good deal that's great okay yeah it's just right there uh yeah if you have any questions email me please and i'll be i'm pretty good with email actually and i'll try to find the other programs and uh any pictures if you want the pictures of the uh equipment i have a presentation on how to build that mount too if you want it i can send you the uh, pdf or the uh, powerpoint you know Shit, I'm, I'm glad people are paying attention to me. Oh, it's man. a great presentation. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Really Thank you, it. Oh, well, it hit the mark right on the head. Just say, this is how to get going. Excellent, excellent. I really enjoyed it. Yep. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Um, so, if, Ted, anything you want to add to this? Or? No, I think it's fun. Uh, we want to generate excitement. Pablo's doing a great job every time. Ted, are you at Green Bank? Uh, no, that is a picture of Berthoud, Colorado. We have a remarkable setup for telescopes and such. So that's my playground. Yeah, I thought, thought <laughs> I heard you nice. refer to Green Bank. So. Uh, Roy, Dave, and Tom, do you guys have any questions or anything I can answer? Uh, either Uh, thanks, uh, Pavel. Uh, this is Roy. Uh, don't have anything right now other than what I put in the chat, but uh, 
as complex as this is, uh, probably will have some at some time. I did satellite stuff in the military, so that's what I've been interested in. Yeah, I'm trying to do uh, EME work now, and uh, I have the uh, another dish, which is a foldable dish, but it's so old that the reflecting cloth doesn't work anymore, so I added the chicken wire again. Uh, yeah. Cool. Time. So uh, I should be uh, on air. I got a 1296 transverter. Um, there's also a, a, a very inexpensive all included uh, mount for satellite work from Australia that I bought and I did a video of that and, and it works amazingly well. Um, but uh, yeah, I do satellite work as well, but this is very exciting. Cool, right. thanks. Cool. Yep. Okay guys, then it's been a pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. And if you don't have anything else, then uh, I'm going to go back back in time at my uh, time tunnel and uh, live in simpler uh, times, you know, back in the 1700s or 1500s. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure. Now, you really you really don't want to go back there, uh, Pablo. No, I was, I was only You really don't. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the future now to see what you know, my grand, great grandchildren are doing. You know, was, I think it was Stephen Hawking's. They asked him about time travel. And he said, nah, impossible. And uh, someone said, well, why, Professor Hawkins and, and Hawkins? And he said, because there weren't any computers back then. <laughs> That's true. Oh, that's funny. Well, this signal that we're getting, this is a time machine because this signal you're getting on the radio telescope, as you know, could be coming from 30,000 to 100,000 light years away. So it started 30, 20, 100,000 years ago. That's what I love about uh, astronomy. It's, it's, it's a time machine. Yep. Okay. Okay, great, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, everybody.